You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button on our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for June 7th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we proudly claim our portion of credit for destroying the Republican Party, it's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. We're going to talk about optimism today, so I don't... I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, that's okay. You you don't need to know what I'm talking about. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'm talking about George Will. Oh, uh, uh, laying the blame for the destruction of his shitty racist Republican Party at the feet of liberals. Oh, how nice! Yes, yes, and he did it on the TV. He wasn't sitting with me on a bus. <laughs> you know, in his own shit, screaming. <laughs> he was actually he had glued. He glued his toupee on real tight. And he was on a morning Joe pimping a book, as one does when one is a discredited Republican loser, um, about how progressivism, how the, the people in the party have nothing to do with conservatism. They're not real Republicans. And oh, the yeah. reason that everything went to shit is that the, the people who run the party or the people in the party have embraced the uh, progressive ideology. Is and this that's the why... Doris Day interview? Is this the one where yes. he said, oh, yes, okay. Very well. right, I do remember this one. Yeah. This is, he said... Donald Trump isn't in my book. He's not even in the index. Right. He has nothing to do with conservative thought. Nothing. Nothing to yeah. do with conservative. Yeah. And it's, you know, and this is, um, I spent uh, most of today, we're recording this on Friday, most of today, uh, combing through Michael uh, Gerson's archive. Uh, it's remarkable how often, uh, with absolute metronomic regularity, conservatives return to the same three or four pathetic, shitty, stupid excuses for why their party is exactly what liberals have always said it is in order to pimp their books and go on TV and lie and how it's really important that they're put in a sort of a petting zoo environment where Willie Geist will never ask them a hard question. <laughs> hey, okay. So Drift Class, I'm going to make a deal with you on this, sure. this podcast. Okay. What's the deal? Is it, have I, I done something wrong already? No, but I've, I've heard on from the Twitter, you know, people on the Twitter saying, well, at least Bible bitch isn't there anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, screw that. <laughs> and uh, also things like, have I banned Green Glenn Greenwald's name from the podcast? No, I haven't. No. But no. you want to talk about Michael Gerson. In a little bit, yes, so, I do. Well, well, we'll do it now. Uh, okay. Do you want to talk about Michael Gerson for a long time, or do you want to talk about Glenn Greenwald for a long time? We have to kind of measure our time out a little bit. I don't want to talk about Glenn Greenwald at all. Oh, good. The sound, okay. editor, the sound editor will just cut it right out. She'll just, I Hooray! mean, this isn't you. I win. You know, this isn't, this is like the Johnny Fever episode where it's not, it's not disco Johnny. It's other Johnny. You know, you talk to the people's various personalities because yeah. he had, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I'm not talking to, I'm not talking to my, uh, my beautiful podcast partner. Right. Now. I'm talking to the cruel Evil, sound editor, nasty sound editor who, who says, just cut, cut out everything. Ten minutes of drift glass going blah blah blah. Grand Greenwald, I was always right. Yes, this is the time check. Um, we have been podcasting now for about two hours, and you're probably only getting the first <laughs> no, two haven't. minutes of this. Yeah, we no. are our timestamp right this minute is four minutes. We just went sure, to four minutes. So that's what you would say <laughs> as having cut out an hour of my right. eloquent flowing blah blah blah. Greenwald. <laughs> Let's just say Glenn Greenwald is now appearing as a regular sidekick to Tucker. Carlson and he's embarrassing everyone who ever backed him except for the hardcore people who find him who will follow him down any rat yeah, hole yeah. he goes and there's, that's a lot of people and the only reason Glenn Greenwald has a job anywhere other than again on the bus next to George Will sitting in his own shit raving is because a guy named Pete Omidyar gave him a quarter of a billion dollars to open his own media company right so he's a rich expatriate asshole living in Brazil and now going on Tucker Carlson's show and Laura Ingram's show to gainsay, to, to agree with all the shit they're talking and about. And utterly insulated from yeah. any consequences that a lot of us are dealing with. Money does that. Abortion or 
hunger sure. or housing crisis no, no, this, or, you know, no, he's completely him. insulated from all of that. And for the, the, the last three Greenwald fans who listened to me ever, mm -hmm, <laughs> you can go back mm -hmm. to me writing about this stuff long ago, back when it was, you know, uh, a heresy and would cost you money and, and traffic. Um, he's always been this way. Yeah. He's always been this way. Now, during the Bush administration, during the height of the Bush administration, he was writing, you know, David Brooks is an asshole who lies all the time. And I completely agreed with him and I went along with him and thumbs up. You're absolutely right. But no, no, he this has always been at the core of his philosophy, which is blowing up the U.S. government. Yeah. And by any means necessary, because blah, 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 proletariat uprising, blah, 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 blah. Glenn Greenwald will be commissar of whatever at the end of that. That's, that that's quite enough, Glenn Greenwald. So yes. uh, Michael Gerson, on the other hand, is Michael Gerson a never Trumper? Uh, yes, he is. Okay. I'm kind of fed up with the never Trumpers. They've been showing their panties this week quite a bit. Yeah. In terms yeah. of, you know, what we really want is Biden to come and take Trump away and leave us completely not responsible for right. 40 years of Republicanism. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, and it's, this um, abortion thing, we're going to get into the whole Hyde Amendment issue, but uh, people like Matt Lewis, you know, oh, so now the pro-life people, anti-Trumpers have nowhere to go mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, Joe Biden <laughs> flip-flops. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so let's do uh, let's do Michael Gerson first, and then we'll do Hyde Amendment. Okay, and I'm right. going to try to keep Michael Gerson uh, high and tight because okay, it, it, it's the point I'm making, and I've written about Michael Gerson before. Michael Gerson is a stalwart uh, Republican stalactite in the Beltway firmament. He ne he has never said a goddamn original thing in his life, as far as I can tell. He was George Bush's speechwriter and George Bush's um, senior advisor, uh, and then backed slowly away from that catastrophe and started blaming Barack Obama for everything that happened with. Uh, that started going wrong afterwards and, and is staunchly loyal to the memory of the imaginary George Bush that he wishes we all would remember <laughs> as opposed to the actual George Bush. But I, I, I went back through his archives. I, we don't have Lexus Nexus here. We don't have a, a, a long subscription to the Washington Post. So this took me some time, but uh, it's remarkable how um, utterly I, either he's the biggest idiot working in the pundit world um, and isn't regularly raked over the coals because he doesn't shine as brightly as Bill Crystal does mm -hmm. or David Brooks mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. um, he's not as sort of flamboyantly wrong about everything and then walks around with his stigmata saying, I've discovered my inner spiritual self. And now everything I said before doesn't count. Yeah. Uh, but he was notorious. He just, I read through just the Obama years to start with. And he just would slam Obama every fucking day as, as you know, a snob and disdainful. And he was, Barack Obama was the most divisive uh, politician in, <laughs> in modern American history. Divisive. Nixon, no. Reagan, no. Yeah. It was Obama. Yeah. And, and this, this goes parallel. And you can actually watch sort of the fire coming. This, I, this is sort of like the Chicago fire. It's, it's way over there. And now it's closer. And now it's closer. You can hear these little alarm bells start to tingle just over the horizon, like in 2010, where there's this tea party. But I'm still just shitting all over Obama as divisive, and he golfs too much, and he golfs at inappropriate times, and doesn't even know the world is watching, and he's bloodless, and he's stupid, and he's, he's, he's this whole thing about no red America, no blue America, and now he's dividing this country for the most vicious political partisan reasons and he was a real asshole about it mm -hmm. and repeatedly an asshole about it. All the while, he is starting to notice that the Republican Party is sort of losing its mind. <laughs> and he cannot, because he's either the biggest liar or he's incredibly stupid, or which I think is a combination of the two, he is just uh, hollow. He doesn't have, he, he does believe in rigorous Orthodox Catholicism. Which is why in between bashing Obama, he obsesses over contraception and Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but his political take on the world is that Obama was the worst president ever. Uh, he refused to go along with those nice Republicans. He refused to, to drop everything he ran on and slash the deficit. Uh, the Obamacare was a disaster. Republicans should definitely work on you know getting rid of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Obama's bad, 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 bad. And then there's this sort of, again, this little tiny fire bell in the distance of uh, there's this group inside the Republican Party that seems pretty extreme, but I'm sure they're okay. 
I'm sure they're fine. I mean, you know, this is just the fringe of the fringe saying these crazy things. And then we go along a little bit further and it's getting a little bit more intense. And then there's the, the election and Barack Obama's a Chicago gangster and a thug and poor Mitt Romney. And the whole run up to the election is, is him desperately trying to give Mitt Romney advice. Oh, wow. That's just all shitty, terrible advice. And him just slagging Obama as a divider and uh, playing race card and da 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 da. This is Michael Gerson, mm -hmm. you know, pious, holier than fucking thou Michael Gerson going on about this. And then the, then the Tea Party takes over and it's it it starts to roll downhill. And he he continues to try to reconcile this fantasy of Barack Obama is is dividing the nation by pointing out that the Republican Party is fucked in the head. With him, Michael Gerson, slowly noticing the Republican Party is really, really fucked in the head. Mm -hmm. But it and, and someone should really do something about that. <laughs> it's it's way over there. I'm sure it won't cause a lot of problems. You know, uh, it, it could at some point in the far, far future be a problem. But, you know, it's certainly a thing. But it's certainly no call for us to be uncivil about it. It's no call for Barack Obama to use nasty playground insults. Oh, my. Uh, Remember all and, the you know, insults the, and, Barack Obama tweeted yes. all the time? Well, and, and because Barack Obama was such a uh, consummate failure uh, at everything he did, he had to blame Republicans for, you know, deliberately sabotaging everything he tried to do, which is exactly what they did. So Gerson is just lying his ass off constantly. And there's absolutely no downside to it. Every time, you know, David Brooks goes off on another book tour, to talk about some other spiritual adventure he's on, they roll out Michael Gerson because he's sort of the break glass in case David Brooks is busy, you know, cheating on his wife guy. So they bring him out and he does – and, and the, the, literally the cadence and the tracking and what he's writing about parallels what Brooks writes about almost exactly. And so then we get into the, the 2011s and 12s and 13s. And the, the Republican Party is really starting to lose it. And this guy named Donald Trump starts to show up on the, on the horizon, who's a joke. He's a clown. There's no chance he can win anything. But the modality of the verbs that he starts to use as the fire bell way in the distance starts to get a little bit closer and a little bit closer. And holy shit, that sounds really close, is obviously Trump will lose to holy shit, Trump must lose. Yeah. And the entire time he, he is congenitally unable to recognize what's going on inside his own fucking party. Mm -hmm. He keeps talking about how, what a shame it would be now that the Southern strategy is no more. <laughs> if the Republican party were, were to sort of grab this whole immigration racist thing, cause that would make us look bad. And we're, a, and, and, and it would destroy the Republican party and it would, and we'd lose in a wipeout because I know everyone in the Republican party. They're all good hearted, kind hearted people. And Donald Trump would just crush them. And destroy everything and no one would back him like asshole it, he's he would rip the heart out of the republican party hey mike he is That's the heart the of the republican yeah. party he is the fuck and so this guy has been spectacularly wrong again he's a speech writer he's the mushroom cloud guy who wrote the mushroom cloud speech for george bush and there is no explanation for why a person this wrong other than he's very humble he has glasses and he always looks like He's afraid someone's going to hit him and take his lunch money. And he, and he's, he sort of, he quavers like David Brooks and he rubs his hands together like David Brooks. And he talks in very pious tones like David Brooks, but he's an asshole and he's wrong about everything. And I just, and today he decided to lecture the left and the right on the importance of civility. <laughs> and I've written about this before and, you know, you, you know, mind your tone liberals. Yeah. Because he has nothing else to talk about. He can't talk about the Republican Party because the Republican Party. Well, but is this is this about Nancy Pelosi, which was leaked, not tweeted, not announced publicly, but leaked from a private meeting where she said she wants to see Trump in jail? It was more just about civility makes our system noble. Civility is okay. how our, our system functions. I believe it starts with a quote from Abraham Lincoln, which always uh -huh. cracks me up okay. when conservatives talk about Abraham Lincoln's civility. And forget that Abraham Lincoln spent his entire presidency destroying the Confederacy. Right. And then right. we can be friends. And burning, and burning it. burning it to the ground. And, and you, just, you just want to slap him and go, do, do you know anything other than what you picked up on the back of cocktail napkins at CPAC in 1997? And the answer is no. He doesn't know a fucking thing. He keeps insisting. I'm consulting with Republicans. And they're telling me no one believes Donald Trump could do anything. 
And he's talking to the same circle jerk group of pundits who've been wrong about everything since forever. He's, I'm sure he's talking to... Or members of Congress yeah. who are terrified to say anything in public because oh, yeah. they know their base will... But this, you know. this, you can, this sort of tsunami that's building and building, you can just see it coming. And the entire time that he that everyone on the left who's writing about the Republican Party is losing its fucking mind, going back to the Obama administration. Michael Gerson and Michael Gerson, people like him are writing about how, how, awful, uh, how awful Obama was and how dumb he was and how he didn't understand America and how divisive he was and vicious he was and cruel he was and, and how he wouldn't cooperate with Republicans. And that was the problem, how he should be focusing on, on cutting deficits and a grant bargain. And that's what America wants. And completely ignoring what was going on inside his own party. And the only thing, uh, theoretically at least, other than complaining about contraception and talking about abortion, the only thing Fred Hyatt pays this asshole to do is sit on his page twice a week and talk about what's going on inside the Republican Party and inside American politics, which is the one subject that Michael Gerson has proven conclusively he doesn't know shit about. So the question then becomes, what utility does he serve? What purpose does he serve? And it's the same as George Will. And it's the same yeah. as David Brooks. There are a small group of rich, inbred conservatives who live in Washington, D.C. and New right. York and Well, they can, re- they can reach a member of Congress by phone for an right. unattributed quote. And That's they, the point. And yeah. they want to believe that the Republican Party is as Michael Gerson lied them into believing it was. And that since something has now gone drastically wrong with it, they want to believe that Michael Gerson was just bamboozled by this. And that, let's shift over to George Will, that the reason the Republican Party suddenly and inexplicably lost its mind was because they became liberals. (laughs) You mean they became uncivil the way liberals are? Is that the point? They became progressives who believe that government should run rampant over everything and untrammeled government power. Because that's what I hear every liberal talking about. Absolute, complete control over everything ever. That's oh, what. Okay. Well, we're going to stop talking about that because I don't want to give voice to that kind of nonsense. No, but I, but I wanted to give a little historical context to how long the rot at the heart of the elite, the the elite conservative public intellectual yeah, yeah. punditocracy has been going on, and how long they've been running this scam out. And like, like a Glenn Greenwald. They would they would have not have a job if they didn't have billionaire backers who just paid them like hookers to put on funny clothes and dress up like pious men right. and tell them the lies they wanted to believe. Without a pile of money keeping these people afloat, they would be unemployed and unemployable. And that's the goal to which we should all aspire. <laughs> so Joe Biden yeah. has changed his mind as uh, Rachel Maddow predicted this this week. She well, predicted him. Um, the 5th yeah. of June, that Joe Biden's stand on the Hyde Amendment would not last through the Democratic primary season. No. And uh, it didn't. It didn't even last 48 hours after Rachel Maddow opened her mouth. No. No. <laughs> uh, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about this because the Hyde Amendment is a point in time at which Republicans and Democrats did compromise. Yes, they did. There was a compromise about abortion, which is abortion will be legal because it, the Roe v. Wade decision made it that way. We're not, the conservatives weren't happy with that, but Roe v. Wade existed. And so Democrats and people who were anti-choice insisted that, tax money would not be spent on abortion. Right. Now, we progressives have all kinds of things that the government does with our tax money Mm -hmm. that we don't appreciate. Mm -hmm. But this was, you know, the bridge too far, and conservatives don't want their tax money spent on terminating pregnancies. So we'll make, we'll put a Band-Aid on this and make sure that tax money is not spent on abortion. Let's be clear. In this country, we're happy to give billions in foreign aid to Israel where you can have abortion pretty much yeah, on demand. On demand. So, yeah. And that doesn't bother evangelicals at all. Right, right. Well, nothing about Israel bothers evangelicals right. because Israel is simply a means to an end. Right. So, and the end is... The end. <laughs> Armageddon, yeah, right. The end, yeah. So we have this compromise. Well, 
the compromise started with abortion is legal. If you're going to make abortion illegal, like they are in other states uh, around the country, Illinois being a state that has codified the right to abortion in law, as California has, Mm -hmm. uh, only in the past week or two, Uh the compromise is over because you've made, you've ruined the first part of the compromise, which is abortion is legal. And so I think the tolerance, our tolerance, this is what gives me optimism, our tolerance for compromise is lower. <laughs> yeah. And I don't see that as a problem. I don't see that as, oh my goodness, it, what happens when progressives become immune to compromise, mm-hmm. that's when the mainstream media starts talking about polarization. And civility. And civility. And civility. Yes. <laughs> Very important. It's very important to have civility and no polarization is when progressives have had it. And particularly now women have had it. So Joe Biden changed his mind, changed his position, and his thought process as he announced it was exactly that, which was it was a compromise before, but now Republicans are so extreme that we no longer have that opportunity for compromise. So I am now against the Hyde Amendment. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, everybody's like, that's great, Joe, but we've got a whole lot of candidates out there who didn't need to go through that thought process. Right. Right. Particularly Elizabeth Warren. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth Warren gave a very good town hall. I listened to the whole thing on Chris Hayes this week. And I have heard every story and every uh, anecdote and every argument that she made before, but look, listening to it all at once. She had a really good week with that town hall. That yes, was, she did. That really turned a lot of people uh, onto her and made people see, oh, wow, she's really something. But I started to, <laughs> to actually tear up during her town hall. Yes, you did. And it wasn't because I was happy. <laughs> no. Uh, and I, I like her and I, I support her ideas and I may vote for her. I'm not sure yet. I'm still mm-hmm. waiting to listen to debates and decide what I'm going to do. I like I like Kamala Harris a lot too. There are yep. other candidates I like. She made me cry because of her optimism. Mm-hmm. And I'm not lacking in optimism overall most of the time. Most of the time I'm a pretty rosy person. But her conviction and her we're going to just fight until we get what we need and get what we people need and get things the way we want them to be. Mhm. And and have a vision for the future that we're going to make real. Uh, it depressed me because I remember what happened to Obama. Yes. Yes. And I remember how much Republicans got away with during Obama. Yes. And I I look toward the future and I think, boy, wouldn't it be great to elect a Kamala Harris or an Elizabeth Warren and you've got this great progressive uh idea factory there Mm -hmm. where you know women's rights are just a given (laughs) women's reproductive rights are a given yep and we have uh professionals in all of the cabinet positions you know there are things that would just immediately improve uh by having a competent democrat and a woman in office absolutely uh but then i think well you know it it took what eight weeks for Hannity to start talking about tyranny when Obama was elected. Oh yeah. Oh, and yeah. you know, he yeah. got John Stewart made fun of him and said, I think you're confusing tyranny with losing. Yeah. But he wasn't, he wasn't no, confusing it, was, it at all. And it wasn't just Hannity. It was everybody. It was, everybody. it was, uh, it was uh, dead Andrew Breitbart who wasn't right. dead at the time. It was everybody on the right. It was tyranny. It was fascism. It was Hitler revisited. It was, you know, it was the end of the Republic. Yep. But this guy got elected. I remember Michelle Malkin. In April 2009, April of uh-huh. 2009, you know, Barack Obama had been inaugurated three months before that. Yep. And in three months, Michelle Malkin had a book out three months into the Obama administration about how untransparent the Obama administration was. The failed Obama administration. The failed <laughs> Lack of transparency in the Obama mm-hmm. administration. Chicago thug, really, and, and a black, <laughs> uh, 
Black Liberation <laughs> Movement uh, yeah, my radical. Question, but my question is, when the hell did she sign the contract for that book? I'll you bet know. it was October. I'll bet it was before the election. Oh, I, I'm sure they saw the this coming and they yeah. all geared up for it. And yeah. here no, you no. go. Here you go. And then, of course, she was on ABC this week and just, you know, she got all kinds of publicity for mm -hmm. because she wrote an anti-Obama book and you got to have both sides on there. Yep. They asked Elizabeth Warren about this. You know, what about Mitch McConnell? What about the Republican Party freezing things and stopping progress? Yes. And she said, well, yeah, we could give up, but I'm not going to give up. I'm a fighter. And so those of us who are in the trenches with her know that this is a trench. And I guess yes, that's what depresses me. Is, yes, we do. Yes, things will get better and we'll have things to celebrate, but I'm never going to take my armor off again. I, I wanted to see her look directly into the camera and say, Dracarys. Yeah, right. All you of know, us are I saying really that. All of us are yeah. saying that. Yeah, yep. burn it. And uh, I think one of the other reasons I've been depressed this week is I did watch the first episode of season three of Fan Made's Tale, where, yeah, I, you know, I don't need to watch that. I just, I don't need to I watch think, that show. I think we need to set the table just a little bit here, to uh, the, the theater of the mind, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so last night we had a date night, you and I. Yes. Uh, we go out to Thrifty Thursdays. It's a yep. it's a price-saving little meal at a, at a restaurant that's where they know us, and it's a lovely restaurant. We ran into uh, some prominent local citizens, including <laughs> yes. the wife of a senator that uh, you senator's all might know. wife that you know personally. Yes. I said, hey. hey. She said, hey. Yeah. So it was that kind of place. Uh, and in preparation for date night, uh, my wife uh, decided to watch an episode of The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> <laughs> because nothing says romantic evening like Handmaid's Tale. I'm sorry. No, no. You have nothing to apologize for. And I did what every good husband did. I said, what's wrong with you? Are you hysterical? <laughs> Do you need a pill? <laughs> Do you need a pill? No, but it is. But the, the your reaction to Elizabeth, Warren, Elizabeth Warren's um, goddamn optimism, as we yeah, right, called it. Yeah, right, right. Um, was something we talked about over dinner. Yeah. Um, and talked about at home and we, we talked about today because that's what we do. We talk about these things. We talk about them a lot because it, it, it really matters to us. This is not, we're not sitting on a mountain of money. We're not protected from the vicissitudes of crazy people. And if Republicans continue to wreck the government, it's going to wreck our family and yep. our lives and that's our health care right. and our kids' education that's and all right. that stuff. So it, it actually, we can't buy our way out of this disaster. Nope. Unlike some people who, have their own media corporations right. or work for the Washington Post. Right. So, but my, I didn't make a counter argument because you never argue with Blue Gal because <laughs> she's very smart and she has knitting needles. And we'll talk about Tex Betsy in a minute. Um, but it was, do you think that Elizabeth Warren and all the other Democrats learned from what happened to Obama? Right, right. That's my only question. Yeah. It's not, it's not that, because all the never Trumpers are arguing for and way too many, like three or four, for my money, it should be zero. Three or four Democratic candidates are effectively arguing for a rerun of the Obama right, administration. Right. Let's just no the, the the fever will break and we'll yeah, compromise. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, and that is what that's what Michael Gerson wants to do. That's what all the conservatives, all the never Trumpers, are like you know, we'll get the most conservative guy in there, and then we'll reach across the aisle and have a grand bargain and cut the deficits. The fever and we'll will break. break. Yes. Yeah. No. And that's yep, never, never fucking going to happen. Right. So the question then is. Um, are they savvy and smart enough to understand what really happened to Obama? What really, really happened to him? Are they savvy enough and smart enough to learn the lesson from it? And are they politician enough and strategist enough to figure out a way to dig us, this is a terrible analogy, dig us out of the trench we're in, to, to climb us out of the trench we're in? And this is going to require overwhelming support from the Democratic base. Yep. It's going to require overwhelming registration of people who want to sit it out or pretend it's not happening or straddle the fence or talk about both sides or whine about civility. Those people are going to have to break in the direction of the Democrats. Right. And and as I said to you last night at dinner, it's going to be a healthcare fight every goddamn day. It's going to yes, be at it, that yes, level of intensity, which is every really day. hard to maintain. And I will tell you, I don't lose my patience very often, but I do lose my patience with white women on Twitter saying they're tired they're because tired. I'm exhausted, mm -hmm. but we don't have time for that. 
And if, no. as, as I said to one, and I, I don't mean to be nasty. I'm not trying to be nasty to anybody. Uh, but, you know, look at, look at Auntie Maxine, 80 years old. Mm-hmm. What has she seen in her life? <laughs> How has she been treated throughout the course of her entire life? Yep. Go, go walk up to Max, Auntie Maxine and tell her you're tired. I'm very tired. You know, I'm tired Maxine. of Trump. I'm tired of having to fight all the time. I'm tired of marching. I'm tired of my, having to call my, my congressman. Feet. You know, enough. It. This is right. the rest of your goddamn life. Get used to it. And your kid's life. And your kid's life. And, and, and yeah. if, you, if you want your kids to have a country and have a planet and have an environment and have a future, this is what you have to this do. This is and the this fight is, we're in. And it's this forever. Is no different. It's it's this not is, Trump. It's forever. And yeah. My granddad, um, you know, hammered together a bunch of boxes mm-hmm. uh, in, during the Depression and hauled ass five states away to hopefully land a job and then send back for his family because that's what you did to survive. Yeah. Now, no one's asking anyone to do anything on that scale. Mm-hmm. But we are asking that you take it very seriously that that the future of your children and your children's children depend on if you get tired, take a break. Yes. If yes. you get pissed, go ahead and scream at me. Go ahead, get right. on Twitter and call me an <laughs> asshole. That's fine. I don't <laughs> care. Well, there, there's micro tired and there's macro tired. There's right. I'm tired there's today ex- and I need to do a little bit of self care right. and just regroup so I can fight again. And then there's right. I just don't want to do this politics anymore. Well, and and yeah. focus your energy. Yeah, right. Um, what gave me um, a little bit of hope? Well, I guess hope is yeah, hope and kind of lifted my spirits as we had coffee yesterday mm-hmm. with Tex Betsy. Yes, we did. Who visited our fair community. Um, and she took the gourmet coffee guideline local. She came here and bought us coffee. <laughs> literally did that. Like took us literally and figuratively. And by the way, she's uh, an old we, school blogger from like 2005. So she, we've she known sure is. her for and, over a decade. Yeah. And uh, um, we get, we promptly got kicked out of the coffee shop we were in, which I think <laughs> because is because they closed awesome. at three in the afternoon. Right. Good lord! Yeah. And uh, again, we ran into prominent local citizens who I was like, "Hey, how's it going? How are you doing?" So it's very weird. Like, how, how do you know it? Yeah. No, just never mind. It's a long story. I'm a local crackpot. I'm adorable, but unemployable. Yeah. Um. So, but we went out and we chatted, and really, her to do list oh my for the causes she is enrolled in. Yeah. Just, you know. During the time when she's not doing her full time job, right. is staggering. Yep. Yep. Um, at every you know anything I can sort of that popped into my head about a social issue, immigration issue, whatever. She could reel off five groups she's involved with, or seven groups yeah. this or whatever. I'm not going to go into any details, but but she's on like the front line. She's at, let's just she say she, she's in Texas. She does stuff with immigration. That's all you need to sure know. So. And and she's amazing. <laughs> and she's and amazing. She's ama- and yeah. she's tireless. And yep. she is committed. And she is very um, you unassuming. You to know her to meet her, you wouldn't assume that she has a ten foot sword in her purse. Yes, right. That she, <laughs> right. She uses for, to, for her to, people for yeah. and for children. I mean, she's yeah. just amazing. So yeah, and talking to her really energized me. The other thing that energized me as well was seeing uh, Elizabeth Warren's video on Instagram where it's Mm -hmm. after the Chris Hayes town hall and she's in her car and obviously her husband or whoever is driving her around (laughs) and getting her to the Mm -hmm. next stop. And uh, she apparently takes the time to have a selfie with everyone that wants one at these Mm -hmm. events, no matter how many people are there. And, uh, you know, retail politics, she's just really good at that. Yeah, she's got, and she's gotten so yeah. much better. Not that she was ever terrible, but she has gotten. You can see that the learning curve, the political learning curve. She's always good on issues, but the political learning curve is just, yeah, breathtaking. Yep. Yeah. And um, I did not emerge um, um, energized from text, Betsy. I emerged uh, feeling ashamed of myself and lazy. <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> well. I felt energized and also lazy, <laughs> but, but yes, yeah. she's, she's an amazing person, but watching Elizabeth Warren, uh, read letters that people had left her during the selfie period that you can actually drop something off with her assistant or whoever. And then she reads them in the car and she was reading mm-hmm. these out loud. And some of them were, I can't wait to call you madam president and, you know, cute things like that. 
And then she would come across a three page letter from a 50 year old woman who has a $72,000 student loan debt, you know, that, Mm -hmm. that Elizabeth Warren's plan is going to save her 50 grand and uh, change her life. But uh, she also hopes that Elizabeth Warren will keep the um, teacher uh, loan deferment plan because she has seven more years to go as a teacher at age 50, you know, I mean, it's just, it just goes on and mm-hmm. on and people do yeah. pour out their hearts in these kind of letters, you know? Uh, but it made me feel better to know that even Elizabeth Warren needs that kind of spiritual food of mm-hmm. hearing the good news of hearing from people that like her, you know, and are on her side. So that that I think is the other thing to remember is that we are a community. You're not alone fighting this. When I say everybody fists in the air, we are never giving up. We're never taking off our armor. We're never going to stop fighting. And yes, it's exhausting sometimes. I'm saying I'm right there with you. You're not alone. And this army is going to take the country to a much better place. Yes. And I saw that today also um, AOC was on... Um, they're they're doing a movement in New York City to break down Rikers, Rikers Island. They're not going right. to they want to get rid of the prison on Rikers Island. Mm-hmm. They want solar panels on Rikers Island <laughs> and a park, you know. And yeah. but she gave a speech on a street corner because the, the this was overflow crowd for a meeting about Rikers. And she, the congresswoman with her congresswoman button, is there on the street corner in New York Mm -hmm. City talking to people and saying, it's not enough to just say, tear down Rikers. We have a vision for what we want the world to look like. And the world includes clean air and clean water as a right. You don't Mm -hmm. need to be in a high rise to have clean water and clean air. Right. And. That is that is what keeps us going is the vision of what we want the world to look like. So even Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez mm-hmm. has to shift her mentality to say, no, we are focused on the good. We're focused mm-hmm. on moving toward the good, not just fighting the rebranding of the Republican Party that is inevitably going to be tried. Right. And... I know that my place in this political universe is in large part to burn the lifeboats. So that's yes. really what I've been that's, called to do. That, that's, that's, <laughs> that's very much my calling as well. And that, that is a backwards looking thing, I realize. Mm-hmm. But I'm 55. So, yeah, yeah. That's, this is what the thing that I can do is I know, what, I know what the signs are. I know what it smells like now yeah. for someone to try to rebrand the Republican party. And I called out a fellow liberal on Twitter today who used the word Trumpism. Yeah. Don't do it. And don't do it. I said, don't, don't you dare call it Trumpism. And I linked to my article from 2016 Mm -hmm. and he replied with one word, fair, you know, fair. Okay. I got you. Now, you know, Mm -hmm. don't do that. That is a rebranding effort. This was the week when I believe Elizabeth Warren wished for Donald Trump, uh, wished handcuffs for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Pelosi told senior Democrats she'd like to see him in prison, to which I say, so say we all. So say we all. This was the anniversary of D-Day. Yes. Which was an impossible feat. Yes. That human beings accomplished. Yes. There's so much bad that happened during World War II, so many atrocities. Mm -hmm. And a group of people who who fought and died and fought some more won democracy for us. They did. Beat the evil back. It did. And the other thing that happened, and I know you want to talk about the moon landing, but mm-hmm. the other thing that it, we uh, commemorated this week is the death of Bobby Kennedy. Yes. And this is something that Joe Biden is, is quite right about, mm-hmm. that – you know, we think things are bad now, but in 1968, when you know Jack had been assassinated and Martin Luther King had been assassinated, and then this, mm-hmm. and Bobby was the last of the three, and my God, yeah, the world was come. The world really was coming to an yeah, end every, at that point. People thought this was the end of the world. This really right. was the end of the world. Yeah, um, there's just I, there is no good in the world that doesn't just get destroyed. 
Yeah. No, I just did want to mention in, in, in terms of impossible things that humans accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the moon 50 years ago. Yeah. And uh, next week, right? Next week. And yeah. um, so we are quite capable of doing extraordinary things. We are quite capable of marshalling our resources and focusing them on accomplishing a goal. Uh, in World War II, it certainly helped that the Russians bore the brunt of the casualties and uh, yeah. drove yeah. the Nazis back from Russia. Um, they, right. they deserve about 70% of the credit for winning World War II. Yep. Uh, but it was and, a and and Russian winters deserve about four yes, percent yes, of the credit as well. Yes, it does. And, yeah. But it, it is very easy to forget that things. I, it's never been this crazy internally. There was all. There's always been an external goal to reach: a moon or a, mm -hmm. a beach uh, in France or whatever. In this case, honestly, the the uh, the goal we have to reach, the enemy we have to overcome, is living next door to us. And yeah. we ha we can't defeat them by force of arms. We can't defeat them by um, technology. We have to just push them out of power and make sure they never ever seize power again. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not trying to destroy anyone's physicality. I'm not trying to kill anybody. No. But I definitely want Republican my the Republicans in my community to be demoralized enough to not vote. Yes. To stay home. I and, want them to feel uh, bad about being. No, Republicans. I guess Trump is an ally in that. Then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I have noticed He's that helping. they've that they have sh they'll they'll start getting real mouthy again uh, about this time next year. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, for now, I I'm not. You can't pry political opinion out of the Republicans around here. Yeah, no, uh, not now. Because they're just, real. They're super quiet. Yeah. They're super quiet. Well, and I wonder if that isn't you know Pelosi's angle re agree with it or not right um and i get that people want impeachment hearings immediately but i think nancy pelosi is a cynic oh yeah and she's just saying fuck this if we do it now no one's going to remember next year that we did any of this right no one's going to remember bob Mueller's name in in september right we won't be talking about him unless trump keeps bringing him up mm -hmm. no one's going to remember the report or anything Unless we have televised hearings three months before the election uh -huh. in July of 2020, if we have hearings mm -hmm. and then start the death by a thousand cuts so that it's all fresh and he's fresh and and damaged. You know, yeah. on October 30th, because mm -hmm. we know what happened to Hillary. Right. It didn't matter that she had binders full of ideas about autism no. and that she'd won three debates no. and that the, her convention, yeah. you know, had Barack. She was up there with Barack Obama, hugging Barack Obama. Right. All of that didn't matter squat because James Comey came out in October and said emails. And took a shit on her campaign. And took a shit on because, her campaign. Because he knew she was going to win. Yeah. And he wanted in the post Clinton uh, during the Clinton administration to be able to say, you know, I stood up to her. I did yeah. my job. It was a great yeah. personal risk, great professional risk, but I was bold enough to step yeah. right out so there. And then when all the Republicans investigated her for four years, right. he was on their side. Right. Yeah. So I think Nancy Pelosi is just being totally cynical about the Beltway media and the American public and everybody's fruit fly attention span. And saying, if we do this now, if we investigate now, no one's going to remember and he'll get reelected. And we'll, and we'll lose the impeachment and we'll have nothing. Right. We'll have four more years of Trump. This is, this is a case, and you can put this on your calendar, mm -hmm. where because this is an entirely internal conversation to the Democratic Party. Democratic activists and yeah, liberals like right. us and so on. I can remove myself far enough to see the logic of both positions. Mm -hmm. I really yeah, me can. Too. Yeah, I can absolutely yeah, see the logic too. of let's start hearings now, right now. We are in peril. The peril is getting worse. Um, every day this guy is allowed in office and, and his people get off with everything scot-free is another day that we're demoralized and our democracy is, is being put through the shredder. I can absolutely understand that position. And Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is one I hold myself. Right. <laughs> and Tuesday right. and Thursday, I'm like, you know what? I, I want this guy gone. The goal is to get the administration this guy runs out of office. Not just him, every one no. of them. All these and, fuckers and have win, to go. And win back the Senate, too. And, yes. and have, have voters in September, October go, why did you allow this criminal to be yes. in office? And but it's got to be 2020, because if it's September of 2019, 
like you say, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I feel this way. Yeah, I know. I know. And, I, but, I, <laughs> and Tuesday hey. and Thursday, I'm like, no, there's a constitution we have to uphold. I'm That's a, our job. You know? I'm a liberal. So, I contain multitudes. So see. <laughs> Love you, darling. And I'm not tired of winning, ever. No, no. <laughs> not ever. <laughs> We're used to losing. So, you know, it's, she's a tactician, and she's thinking about it with a very cynical, negative attitude towards mm-hmm. human nature, which is, yeah, 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 you all want impeachment. You all want it to happen now. You want hearings on TV now. What are hearings on TV going to do to get us rid of republicanism? Right. It's my, that's my goal is to make sure that there's a Democrat in the White House, that the Democrats have 51 votes in the Senate, and that we keep the House. That's our goal, period. To bring it back to George Will, because all mm-hmm. roads lead to George Will. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, God. In, in the truest possible sense, Donald Trump is a Republican. He is the heart of the Republican Party because... The Republican Party now exists solely to make people like us incoherently angry at the horrible, horrible shit they do and say. Mm -hmm. That's the only – and get tax cuts for Mitch McConnell's cronies. That's it. They have no other policy. And regulation for polluters. Yes, those those things, yes. And so when I find liberal friends and colleagues just stuttering incoherent with apoplexy every day to the point where they can't – construct a sentence because they're so angry at mm-hmm. how mm-hmm. wretched and racist and awful Donald Trump is and how everyone around him is a scumbag and they're all corrupt and they all should burn in hell. It's like you can't, that's not what sustaining your anger feels like. Mm-hmm. That's what letting these lunatics live in your head feels mm-hmm. like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I much prefer, and I, I break my own rules as often as I abide by it, just just so we're clear. Yeah, you're I not much perfect pref- at this. <laughs> no. Oh, God, no. Oh, no, no. But I, I've I've learned that I deal with crazy Uncle Liberties in my life and mm-hmm. people in, on social media who want to do that as one would deal with an addict um, who is absolutely categorically in denial about their addiction and absolutely categorically refuses to do a goddamn thing about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can't reason with them. You can't. You cannot – berate them into it. You can't guilt them into changing. You can't, there's nothing, they're, they're beyond your power to do anything about. And I use that very advisedly because, you know, alcoholism runs in my family mm-hmm. and I have friends yeah. who, are, yeah. who are recovering. Right. So I use that very advisedly, but I use it very specifically because being a Republican manifests itself exactly the way an addict. And I've been saying this since I started blogging. It is, uh, they have a constant 24-7 uh, grocery store for their drug of choice, which is Fox News and Hate Radio and Breitbart, who will feed their addiction all day long. They have an escalating need to chase the high. You know, it used to be Reagan, then it was Bush, and now it's Donald Trump. It's just fucking ketamine to the heart, man. That's that's the only thing that gets them going in the morning. And and what makes them – what what gives them that dopamine rush – is making you fucking miserable. And now making you miserable means putting kids in cages and laughing about it Mm -hmm. or getting Mm -hmm. on Twitter and calling Bette Midler, you know, a scumbag. Right. That's what makes them happy. And, and they must be removed from power up and down the ballot. They must be removed from Congress up and down the ballot. They must be removed from your life. If at all possible, these people cannot, these are toxic people, but just getting incoherently enraged by them every day um and just did you hear what donald trump did today every fucking day gets you nowhere let's all stipulate donald trump is the worst president in history possibly the worst human being in my experience in my life at a national level ever and everyone around him needs to be gone let's all stipulate to that Let's all be pissed that the Republican Party down to the grassroots is all okay with that. Let's all agree that the people who put him in power want to keep him in power specifically to make people like us cry. Stipulate to all that. Now let's find the places in the system that are weakest and jam crowbars into them. Let's burn the lifeboat so that the people who made the monster factory possible don't get to slink away from it and go write books about, oh my God, the Republican Party is full of Republicans. How the fuck did that ever happen? Those people are not allowed at my party. (laughs) Let's find candidates who know how to motivate people at the grassroots level and how to unite the Democratic Party. Because the Democratic Party is the only place where any adults are having any conversation about anything of importance. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So we're going to argue because we're basically a whole bunch of parties within one party because there's no place else for us to go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's just the way things are. So it is my counsel is simply um, don't let him get in your head. And that will you will find yourself less exhausted if you can do that. Yeah. 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 Don't normalize it. Don't you know, that's not normalizing it. That's not saying, well, you know, it's all bad and everything's awful and let's just shrug it off. That's not what that means. It means mm-hmm. don't let yourself be triggered into a, into going yeah. apeshit. Every time Donald Trump says something insane, because escalating the insanity on Twitter is what he's going to Mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. until he is no more. That is his that is his entire future. That's the Republican Party for the rest of your life, as far as I can tell. And as long as they are a diminishing echo from what they are now and getting crazier and crazier and smaller and smaller until they're basically the LaRouche party. um, That's fine. They have no power. They can have uh, great health care, courtesy of Democrats. They can have great education, courtesy of Democrats. They can have clean air and clean water, courtesy of Democrats. That's fine with me. Right, right. But don't let them get in your head to the point where you can't stop walking around demanding that God strike all of them down. (laughs) Again, I do this all the time myself, so I'm giving myself some counsel for future. When I come back and listen to this podcast um, and wonder, what did she cut out this time? Yeah, there you go. Uh, we should mention this Catholic bishop in Springfield, <laughs> Illinois, that decided yeah. to announce that he's not going to give communion to anyone who believes in pro-choice. Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. <laughs> all of the all of the Democratic politicians in at the state house, uh, he will not give them communion. Uh, he's Bishop Rothacki. I want I'm, Popraki. I'm not... Popraki. Popraki. Okay, Pop yeah. Rocks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bishop's Pop Rocks uh, yeah. has made national news by saying this. Repeatedly. Repeatedly, he, he, yes. Yeah. And the only thing I just want to let everybody know is that I know Catholics in Springfield and everyone thinks that he's a nut. Right. And I'm not saying that to make excuses for the Catholic Church because there are no excuses for many of the things the Catholic Church has done. No. Uh, but even on a level where... You know, local Catholics who are not raping children, <laughs> yeah, uh, think that this guy is off the deep end mentally. Without without any ado, I think the uh, Catholic Church infrastructure uh-huh. could get rid of him <laughs> yeah. if they wanted to, uh, just uh, without yeah. violating their principles, because yeah. he's just. He's crazy. They're so, keeping him here for a reason. And, and I, I think they're keeping him in Springfield so that he's not, yeah, in a higher, yeah. larger city where he'd have more of a microphone than he does. It's a yeah. holding pen. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Know. That's unfortunate. Uh, I did want to mention two other things. Uh, one is Chris Saliza broke the biggest fucking story of his career. What? Uh, it was um, headline. This is breaking news as of yesterday, I believe. Yeah. The Republican Party isn't who you think it is. Da, da, da. Da, 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 da. Yes, there, I'm quoting him now. There's a common trope in politics uh, that a Republican Party is composed of and controlled by affluent white men with stacks of Ivy League degrees among them. Nobody believes that, Chris. Nobody, Nobody believes that. that. Uh, a lot of assholes that you hang out it's, with and get drunk Trump with. It's Trump that bitch t-shirts right. is who runs the Republican Party. Come on. This, this might have been true at some point in, in the history of the Grand Ole Party, but it sure as heck isn't an accurate picture of Donald Trump's Republican Party. This is just now occurring to Chris <laughs> Salud. This and and he, Chris Salud is everywhere. He's on CNN. He's got his own column. He's been this degree of sort of deliberately dumb as a rock, oblivious to everything around him forever, and for reasons again that no no one can explain. Neither God nor man nor devil has has come to me and explained this to me. Chris Salud still has a fucking job at the Washington Post. So this this astonishing and at CNN. That's big story number one. Big story number two is uh, a reminder that both siderisms, uh, the, the, the scourge, the big lie against which we all invade, that we talk about a lot on this podcast, has actual consequences. Mm-hmm. Trump, pressed on the environment in the UK visit, says climate change goes both ways. <laughs> because he- let's face it, he's got you know tertiary syphilis in the brain. I'm theorizing because that's how he's acting. He's he really is just degenerate in the brain. He's got a broke brain. He can't think more than 
five words ahead. He doesn't know what to say half the time. He wanders around. He's a racist. He's an asshole. He's all the horrible things that you all know he is. So when he's flailing around looking for an explanation to give to the royal family, to the prince that he's talking to, British royalty, uh, climate change goes both ways. And then comes out this long, incoherent jumble about tornadoes and hurricanes and in ancient times, so thus and so. But the words that he was taught to say to get him out of an embarrassing corner in which he paints himself is, you know, climate change goes both ways. And that's how bad this lie has become. It is the all purpose everywhere. I, I call this a nine millimeter revolver of, of political rhetoric because it's cheap. It's plentiful. And it ends the conversation without settling a goddamn thing. Mm -hmm. It's just, Nope, both sides do it. And the conversation is over because who wants to argue past that point? Yeah. Who wants to who wants to penetrate that and say no? You're fucking wrong across the. See, drift class. Like, that's the thing that also makes me a little bit optimistic, which is mm -hmm. we are really seeing a meltdown of discourse on the right. Yes, to the we point are. of just all we can do all day long is defend this president. That's it. Right. We talk about Trump stealing bandwidth from Twitter and so forth. Mm -hmm. Really, he's stealing bandwidth from the Republican Party, and yes. nowhere was that more evident this week that then on a european trip yeah oh god yeah, yeah. where yeah. you're with allies you're in pomp and circumstance the weather was good you know he had his beautiful wife next to him his idiot children were there so well he... don't get me started yeah mm -hmm. but average president just the most average gerald ford let's go there right. an right. average republican president would use a trip like that to appear presidential Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nixon mm -hmm. was able to appear presidential, go overseas. That's your go-to if you're having troubles at home with your, you know, approval rating or whatever. You go overseas. You're on television at home, meeting the Queen of England. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and Trump isn't able, the master of television and ceremony, and reality tv isn't able to not screw this up at this point right and the effort that it took morning joe to make that speech appear to be a normal everyday thing of he did a good job right he did he a good job reading off the teleprompter let's hope he means it says joe scarborough yeah. He doesn't remember it, it. No. Immediate, <laughs> and then he goes off to, to the cemetery at Normandy and starts trashing uh, Bob Mueller. Yeah. And, and just, just being Trump because Trump yeah. is an asshole. Yep. Right. Um, right. There's, I, I'm, I'm drawn to the Al Pacino character in Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, who's explaining to the Kevin Spacey character, your job is to help us not to fuck us up. Yeah. Does that seem clear to you? Yeah. Donald Trump is incapable of not fucking up everything. Yeah, that's a given. And he's in charge of the <clears throat> he's, he's, in charge. he's the titular head of the Republican Party. Yep. Yep. So that's and that's where we're at. And who doesn't think that this Fourth of July celebration of Donald Trump isn't going to be a disaster? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the things that he the things that he has in his orbit to make himself look powerful and competent, he's wasting every day. So that does give me optimism, but uh, we have to keep fighting. We do. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. But this week we have an internet dog. This week, Buddy the dog is at our Facebook page and website. Buddy was adopted from the SPCA just over 11 years ago. He walks his owner while she listens to the podcast. Isn't that nice, Buddy? I'm glad you're able to do that. That's nice. Uh, and Buddy is a cancer survivor. Well, good for you, Buddy. Congratulations to the, about that, too. Mm -hmm. Buddy doesn't mind at all, also, if we mention our fake sponsor, Freshly Poured Cat Food. If you buy Pet Store Perfection or Dollar Store Direct, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that whatever cat food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. So you can visit Buddy at our Facebook page and website. You can also send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. 
feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. You don't have to come to Springfield, Illinois to buy us the coffee. No. You can just do it on the internet. We're grown-ups. <laughs> we could do it ourselves. Go to our website, proleftpod.com, and there's all kinds of ways that you can give us the price of a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, this is not charity. This is our job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. We have PayPal, postal address information. We have our Patreon, GoFundMe, and Buy Me a Coffee options. It's all there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties think Washed Up Psycho is going to make a killer garage band name. Let's think about living. Think about living. Let's think about loving. Think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Lovey, lovey, lovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018. DJ